Well, everybody, welcome to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. And this is um, going to be a fun one for me because um, I have a colleague of mine that I've been doing some research with, um, Daniel Isguardo from Bitergia. And we presented, uh, what was a week ago Saturday, at the ICGSE, a very, very abbreviated version of this. So we thought we would do um, a deep dive today um, because there were a lot of questions about how to use the analytic tools, why we're doing it. And so we're going to take this opportunity when most of you are probably off on vacation to steal an hour from you and um, talk about how um, in the OpenShift Commons and the OpenShift ecosystem and the Kubernetes and the CNCF ecosystem, we've taken um, a data-driven approach to doing community development and how that has helped me um, really be able to be effective um, and nurture a healthy, diverse, hopefully very engaged community around OpenShift, OKD, Kubernetes, all the CNCF projects we're incubating, operators, all those kinds of good things. So I'm um, going to move motor through this so that we can get to the deep dive a little bit, but I'll, I'm going to set the stage first and then we're going to have De uh, Daniel do a bit of a demo of how this all works. So this is the paper that Daniel and I wrote together. Um, this diagram is out of date though because it is um, based on data from GitHub and other sources which we'll talk about. Um, but it's what I generally refer to as my jellyfish diagram and it basically maps out all of the network relationships, the network, the relationships and the networks between them, between the projects, the people who are contributing to the projects, participating in them, um, across the CNCF, Kubernetes, and OpenShift ecosystems. And we'll dive into that a little bit more. And if you know Red Hat, um, you know that you've probably seen the screen before, and um, you know that we're really all about open source um, and believing very deeply, and it's in our DNA, that um, open source is the source of all the technology innovation that's happening today in the world. Um, and, you know, GitHub is where we, we live and breathe. These numbers, again, are a little out of date, but, um, and they've grown exponentially. I think it's 125 million repositories at this point. Um, it's huge. And um, there are just a few of them on the screen. And OKD, which was formerly known as OpenShift Origin, um, is the one that we're going to focus on a little bit today. And so if you don't know OKD, um, it is uh, the OpenShift distribution of Kubernetes. Um, basically, we like to say it's a function of Kubernetes plus plus all of the other things we add into it at um, Red Hat. Um, OpenShift uh, is easy to find. It's going to be GA hopefully next week um, with the 4.5 release of OpenShift. We'll have a distro of OKD4 for you. Um, and you can try it out at OKD.io. But it basically is um, a community distribution of Kubernetes. Um, and one of the things that happened um, over the course of time, um, um, maybe four years ago, we switched from a standalone open source project uh, that was Origin to being um, rebasing and re-architecting OpenShift on top of Kubernetes um, and using, you know, heavily using containers. So if you're an oldster from OpenShift like me, you still remember gears and cartridges. But then um, when we switched over, um, we really uh, had to refocus how we looked at what community was. And the reality check and the honest thing was that for the most part, um, the contributions to Origin were Red Hat based. It was Red Hat dominated. Um, there were a lot, once we took Red Hat out, there were a lot of external uh, folks uh, contributing to the project, but, you know, and still today um, on the, the value added parts of OpenShift, um, they are primarily things that are integrated and added to it, um, the value adds by OpenShift. So um, I'm not going to change my tune on that. That is really where most of it is. But the big change has been, um, for us, and, and the complexity comes in where we have this ecosystem-based model that we switch to. If you go to Commons, you'll see there are, you know, right now over 585 member organizations that are part of that. These are end users, integrators, cloud providers, upstream project leads, tons of people having conversations that we have to interact with and understand where they're coming from. And then we've seen um, what I call the rise of the interrelated cloud-native ecosystems, and it's Everybody shows this picture. It's crazy. 
I know, but it actually is very helpful when you um, filter it down to some of the open source projects that are being incubated. And that's really what I tend to focus on is these ones that are um, either incubated or graduated. I do, trust me, I look at all the sandbox ones too, but for this analysis, we're just going with graduated and incubated projects. Um, and then we're adding in uh, the wonderful world of operator framework. So the vote just took place and it's just been accepted as an incubated project. I think it's going to officially be announced probably next week. I think on the 9th is when the press release went out. So that we have to add in for that all the operators that we're building, things that are in operator hub and the operator framework itself. So this landscape just keeps growing. And it's impossible to really understand all of the relationships or to know all the people in your community. What I like to say is in the past, community managers usually focused on one single um, project and trying to get people to work on just that one. And we don't have that luxury anymore. There are so many interdependencies on the different projects that are working on pieces that are layered on top of OpenShift, are integrated into OpenShift, or run underneath OpenShift. And all of those release cycles, um, product roadmaps, feature requests, issues, everything you can possibly imagine, bugs, you name it, all have an impact on each other. And then the human side of it is, as well is really, I think, the thing that from community development point of view is um, it's unknowable without using a data-driven approach. So, um, you know, I can create all the spreadsheets I want from mailing lists um, and analyze them up the wazoo by myself by hand. But about, I think it was, two, did we decide when we first met Daniel, when you first showed me the Biturgia Grimoire Lab, was that 2016? I forget. It was 2014 in, during the OpenStack Summit. That yeah. Was the first time. So we've been, I've been looking at this magic for a long time and, um, have been implying it, trying, you know, first the dashboard, which gives you the pie chart and breakdown of the contributors, and then this network analysis stuff. And so we've sort of ingrained this into the way that I, uh, my day-to-day -day approach to working with um, the many communities. So I've been able to um, scale myself in some ways in a way that I couldn't formally do without having a data-driven approach. And these data-driven approaches um, the sales teams use them, CRMs are them, uh, you know, those are customer relationship management things. This should be a community relationship management tools is what the way that we look at this. And so basically what we're just doing is applying some data science and analytics to the problem space of understanding who's in your community, how to nurture them, how to support them, and how to reach out and connect with them and connect each, them to each other. I'm going to stop. I'm going to let um, Daniel talk a little bit about, now that you know how complex the, the problem is, about the tools that we have um, and the data sets and where we're working with. So, Daniel, go right ahead there. Yeah. Um, sure. So, one of, uh, the analysis is based on Git repositories. So, if we think about uh, the usual data sources in any open source community, we have a bunch of uh, data sources. By data source, I mean pieces of infrastructure that we may be using. So you have already mentioned Diane, some of them as the mailing list, or we have Slack channels, we have uh, Git repositories, some of them are using GitHub, some of them are using GitLab, Atlassian stack. Uh, so there, there are several of them, and typically those data sources are from five to 10. We think about development activities, communication channels, uh, outreach to, other, uh, to the uh, general public. So in this case, and for today, uh, we are uh, just focusing the analysis on Git, which is kind of a big chunk of, of this. And then we are uh, we are focusing on CNCF, OpenCF, and operators. So you can uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, so for the tooling, and this is how we are moving from, from art to science, what, what we call how to apply uh, this data-driven approach to community development. So uh, we are using Grimoire Lab. Grimoire Lab is, is part of the Chaos project, and this is under, under the umbrella of the Linux Foundation. So Chaos is the acronym for Community Health Analytics for Open Source Software. Um, and we are working there in, in two main areas. One of them is uh, defining metrics from a technological agnostic point of view. So just discussing about metrics and bringing some specific definitions of those. 
um, looking for use cases, and, and, and there are several working groups there. So we are talking about the diversity and inclusion working group, we are talking about a risk working group or a value working group from an, from an open source perspective. And then the second uh, bunch of people are focused on, on software. Um, there, are, there are several tools there. One of them is Remark Lab, which is who we are presenting today. And, and uh, I'm one of the participants or original developers here. Um, then we have Ogor, which is another tool uh, uh, doing uh, pretty focused on, on GitHub, uh, as far as I remember. And then there are a couple of extra tools around. So Remark Lab, this is the architecture that, that you can see. This is, um, so it's, it's not only about retrieving information. So there is a, a pre-processing and post-processing of existing data. There is uh, specific problems that we have to deal with as identities or affiliation management. Um, the, how to automate all of this, how to have this in, in production, and then at the very end, how to produce value to the end user, right? So uh, starting for, for, from the left side of the of the chart, we have a bunch of data sources. Some of them we have we have mentioned them. So Git repositories, uh, Docker, Jira, uh, we have Baxilla and some others. Um, then right after this, we have Perceval, which is the tool to, to retrieve all of these. And this is producing some data transformation. So this is uh, your front end uh, to transform any kind of log or API into a JSON document. And this is temporarily stored in uh, in some database, but then at the very end, this is creating a new index in, in Elasticsearch. Elasticsearch is the uh, database we are using here, the persistent database, and then we are creating raw indexes. At the same time, the, the tool that you can see uh, right in the middle, Lumar ELK, it's, it's the data processor. So this is kind of saying, okay, I have a new JSON document, so I'm storing this in Elasticsearch. And then at the same time, I'm, I'm asking Sorting Hat, hey, we have a new identity here. What do I do with it? So Sorting Hat is the tool that will take care of all of the identities and affiliations. And Sorting Hat uses another database. Um, why do we have this in this case? This is to be uh, GDPR uh, compliant. So we have a, kind of an external or third party database where we can store everything and then everyone can opt in or opt out uh, from the rest of the visualizations and and so on. So you can anonymize the, the information, let's say. So once we have uh, Sorting Hat doing its job, we have uh, uh, the raw indexes, then the next step is to enrich those indexes. By enrich, um, it means basically creating um, uh, specific indexes uh, focused on your business model. And the business model we are talking today is about community development. So we are uh, processing those data sets that are in the raw indexes into something more meaningful for the final user. An example here, if we think about uh, the Git activity, and we have a bunch of commits, right? So in a commit, we, we see the author of the commit, we have the committer, we have the date, we have the time zone. Uh, we know the files that were modified or, or moved or copied or, or, or created from scratch. Then we have the lines for each of them that were added, removed, or, or modified as well. So all of this information uh, can be parsed and can be transformed. So for instance, by default, Grimoire Lab is, pro is producing, as far as I remember, three or four indexes based on Git information. One of them is working at the granularity of commits. So we can go there and check who is working uh, uh, with who in what commits and or file paths, etc. Uh, the next granularity, the, uh, a more finer granularity that we have here, we can go at the level of, of the file path. We know uh, where specifically certain organizations or people have been participating at. So if we if we are uh, if we have some critical area in in our open source project and those developers leave the community because there's turn turnover, right? Turnover happens. Um, so then we can look for the right expertise to try to fill that knowledge gap. But we need that data in advance, right, to, to understand what's going on. Uh, then there is another index that we, we can create, for instance, or we are creating, which is the analysis of what we call the onion analysis. So if we think of open source communities as an onion, it's, it's a bunch of layers, right? At the very center, we have the core set of developers. So uh, by definition, we, we name them as those producing 80% of the activity of the commits in this case. Then we have uh, regular developers, those 
reduce in the next 15 percent and then we have this long tail of open source developers that we see in, in any open source project that are producing one commit two three four five so those are the casual developers and those are typically filling up to the 100 percent so producing this last uh five percent so from just let's say one data source which is git we can we can start producing specific indexes right so this is what we mean by enriching indexes and then at the very end at the bottom uh, right part of the of the chart you see kibiter which is a downstream version of kibana with let's say certain uh, extra vitamins and, and plugins and so on everything is open source by the way and then uh, just the end user that can visualize all of this information and navigate through the data and check and create new visualizations etc cetera, et cetera. So this is the tooling we are using, and this is going to model up. So a, a couple of points about this. I think um, you you went a little fast over the sorting hat and the identity merger, and I just want to um, harp a little bit on this. If you notice all of those different data sources, and you think about who you know, if you're listening to this later, how many different email addresses you use in all of these different data sources, and um, you know the the idea that. Um, we would know who you are, or we as a community manager would know, oh, this is my Stack Overflow um, persona, oh, this is my Twitter persona, oh, this is my GitHub persona. Um, that uh, that makes, when you try and un untie the, the knot that is um, community relationships, those are some of the things that um, having this facility to do the identity merger across all of these different data sources is really huge. Um, it also leads to the other conversation that we have about anonymity um, and it, ensuring that we respect people's privacy and if they want to be anonymous somewhere they are. So a lot of um, what you'll see here uh, today is we're really focusing on um, public identity stuff, stuff that is in GitHub and that's so what we're doing. So if people think that's, that they're still anonymous in the world. Um, we need to really um, let them know that, that this is a very simple open source tool, um, an engine um, that people can, it's really, you're no longer anonymous, I guess is the point that I'm trying to get to here. Um, and, and so that's, that brings in another level of conversation about um, moving from art to science as well as, you know, are we GDPR compliant? Are we following, you know, the legal stuff? So a lot of that, um, Conversation. I think that's another whole day's worth of conversation too. But um, just to let people know, we are working within the legal framework of how we are allowed to use this data. Um, and so, just to set that stage. And really, I spend most of my time in that browser box at the end, and a little bit of my time at um, doing some corrections in the identity merger space. So, as a community person working with this data set. Um, you really need to have some domain ex, um, experience with it. So I, if you look at someone's GitHub repo, it may have contributions to Kubernetes, Prometheus, and then there's some gaming platform over in left field. You need to know enough about the ecosystem to know that that gaming platform isn't really, or hopefully isn't really um, something that has a repercussion for your, your ecosystem. So having domain expertise about whatever you're analyzing is really important. So, um, shall I move to the next slide and let you, there you go, um, explain. <laughs> yeah, so uh, perhaps just another addition. So there are, there are, so we are not the only ones doing this, right? And there are already open source communities uh, providing such information about identities and affiliation, specific purpose of attribution, which is what we are doing here, right, to, to help uh, advancing in, in the development of the community and, and having everyone on board earlier or faster uh, with the proper tools. So uh, communities as OpenStack or CNCF, they, they already have certain public uh, data sets with specific identities and affiliations for all of the developers. And this is even community created. So that means that the, you as a, a member of the community can go there and say, I am this person I, and I've been working in this company A, B and C for during these years. So then your contributions will be correctly displayed. And this is, this is at the end important for, for, uh, for organizations so they can, they can see specifically what's going on. And then we can have some other discussions about um, 
what does it mean, for instance, uh, influence in an open source community? So we can talk about specific roles as maintainers or, or proper developers. So who's playing that role uh, from what company that person is specifically coming from? And if we go for a more aggressive perspective, then we can go uh, we can go and have specific questions are what are my competitors doing in the technologies that are specifically uh, key for my technological stack? So then you need to have certain uh, knowledge. And all of these data-driven approach is quite useful to understand what's going on there because you, ha you can have specific, quest um, specific answers to, to those questions beyond your perception, right? Yeah, I think I started out using the network analysis stuff to understand who was in my community. And I always say that when I'm talking to um, people who do community development, that the most important first step is knowing who's in your community um, and how to connect with them and how they're connected to each other. So um, you can do all the content development, write all the, the documentation you want, but if you really don't even know who your audience is or who the participants are in your community, um, you're going to end, end up rewriting that or reframing it in some way. So. But there's also the, and we, we talk about it quite often, the idea that this is one way to see where the community is going. So um, in some of the earlier analysis and we've done, you can see as, as things like Jaeger took off and open tracing and, open, and Zipkin and, and some of the things, you could see people moving from one project to the next. And that historical analysis um, and hopefully predictive analysis is the next layer that we might want to layer into this too to see where the, as a Canadian is want to do, where the hockey puck is going um, is really what you want to be watching for too. So the baseline stuff that you need to do, in my humble opinion, is really know who's in your community and how they're all connected to each other. And then starting, you, then once you have that grasp of your community, moving and applying that to paying attention to new projects, serverless or Lego or you know, a bazillion other projects as they pop up because then you can start watching the key folks here and what they're contributing to. And it's really amazing what you can learn from this. And you can get lost. It's sort of like social media. Um, you can go down a wormhole too, but you always come back up and, and see how things are interrelated. So it's very, it's been hugely helpful for um, developing the OpenShift Commons and, and, our, and making sure everybody is properly connected and supported. So. With, uh, from indeed from from that perspective, I think it's uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, before entering into metrics discovery process is really useful to have certain strategy on the table and, and, and certain methodology. So people tend to to, to, to to have metrics for the pleasure of having metrics. and the problem sometimes is that you you may lose track of where you were going. Well, if you have a proper, you know, method and strategy and 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 the action plan, then you can you can play with the data, but then you can come, you, you know, that you have a path, right? So then this is the right way to to proceed. The the other thing, and and we're, we'll get to the demo in a second here, but the other thing that's really important for people to understand too is like pretty much every large project has a dashboard. You know, that shows you the static stuff and who's the biggest contributor to this project and who's doing the most in this project. And it's, you know, it's a bragging right for corporate contributors or individual ones. And it's a great way to know how to reward people. But it's, um, it's really almost useless for doing community engagement, um, those static pie charts and things. You really need to understand the relationships, not the numbers. Um, uh, and, and I think that's what this demo hopefully will show you a little bit of. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and let you share yours. And okay. then we'll see um, how we're doing here for time. Oh, we're doing okay. Because Daniel and I could talk about this for days. And um, Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe it's more to introduce a more the concept of personas and how we were playing with this, do you think? Uh, well, first show the, the what you had there for the open the second tab there because that's the okay. one I think is the the basis of the jellyfish mm -hmm. and um, for me like the jellyfish diagram we use in the article and this is really the thing that you can't see in screenshots and stuff but you can dive into here are um, the connectors here so the large jellyfish there is Kubernetes and the smaller one 
um, is OpenShift. And so we can look at the relationships between who's contributing to OpenShift and who's contributing to Kubernetes. So if you dive, keep diving, and it's, you know, as the complexity gets bigger, you can start to, and Pants is in there, Luca is in there, Seth is in there. Like I, um, because I've been working in the OpenShift community, I know almost everybody here. Um, mm -hmm. But if a new person pops in, then I'm, you know, I become aware of it. And you can also get list views of this and all kinds of cool stuff. But it also starts to show you, if you zoom back out, um, I think you've added in Jaeger here. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, Jaeger at the bottom. Mm -hmm. You can see who's working on OpenShift, who's working in Kubernetes, and who's also working in Jaeger. So um, this became important for me um, when Jaeger, when the Jaeger team from Uber and Red Hat said, okay, we'd like some help from you, Diane, to get us um, into incubating status over on CNCF. And I did not know everybody in the community. So I was able to pull in this data um, look at who from Red Hat was contributing, um, who from Uber and other places, and these were my key people to connect with um, to help move that project through to the next level. And um, the team did an awesome, and you can see Yuri's there and a bunch of other folks. And so they may not have been contributing to my project, OKD, Origin, OpenShift, but they were contributing to a key thing in the ecosystem, Jaeger and open tracing, um, that was integral to people successfully using OpenShift um, and us deploying it, you know, in over 2000 enterprises. So this was a, a great way to use the network analysis in this space. And maybe uh, you wanted to add a few more words in there about how this actually oh. Works. Yeah. So, uh, uh, so just to mention, to, to explain a bit more how how this works. So uh, that we didn't we didn't do in the, in the previous in the previous slide, although it was already explained. So each of the dots that we see are are developers. So those are those are displayed if they have uh, committed uh, uh, something during the last year, as we can see here, um, to either uh, uh, Kubernetes in this case, OpenShift, and Jagger. Jagger, I think, is already a graduated project, right? Because we have uh, this strongly assigned to incubating. Mm -hmm. But in any case, we uh, we specified this filter here, so we we are sure that we were analyzing only Kubernetes, OpenShift, and Jagger. So that, that's why we know this is Jagger, and this is not any any other project in in the uh, incubating or graduated ecosystem. So um, the, the the bigger you are, that means that you have committed more uh, more commits. To that specific project. So then we have some uh, dots around that are a bit bigger than the others. So those are developers uh, that have contributed some more commits than the average. We can see some of them here. And then we see this this number of developers here that are linked. Uh, are they have an edge into Kubernetes and they have an edge into OpenSea. So this means that during the last year, those developers, all of these here, have contributed to both worlds. So in this case, Kubernetes and and OpenShift, and the same the same thing happened here. So we have these three developers uh, that during the last year uh, we see that have contributed to OpenShift and uh, Jaeger in this case, and then we can see some uh, other that have contributed to Kubernetes and Jaeger as well. So all of these people. Um, so these are the basics of the network uh, diagram. It, it, it's true. So in, in addition to this, or on top of this, we can specify certain filters as the ones we already provided. We can go for the time ticker here. So we can go for the last month if we are interested. And then we can produce other or other kind of, of data sets or, or widgets. So for instance, you were specifically uh, commenting the newcomers. So we can have a list of the very last people that join the community. So then we can say uh, from a community perspective, hello, welcome. Uh, you can you can help them or facilitate the process to uh, for the onboarding process and so on. So may, maybe you can detail a bit more, uh, Diane, your your specific work there. Yeah. So I think um, one of the things that that is hard to tease out is um, retention of newcomers, engagement with newcomers, when new organizations. And so um, from my perspective, I'm very organizational based. Um, so when a new organization starts contributing to OpenShift or starts using OpenShift, 
um, I, I want to know about it. Um, or And so this data is also includes, um, they've logged an issue, they've made a comment in Stack Overflow, all, all kinds of different places. So this um, really helps me as a community development person um, understand um, new entrants and when they are, and then the onboarding process begins, the outreach, making sure that they have what they need, and that doesn't always mean like stalking them or throwing information at them. It's just being aware is huge because then when they come and they show up at maybe your event or they ask a question, you know, you're already aware that they're, they're, they're in, in the community and um, that gives you a step, step ahead. So I think that there's like, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, is there's a number of personas that we tease out um, from this data. Um, that really helped. And maybe um, if you dive into maybe the, the Clayton Colon um, mm -hmm. historical analysis, that'll help a little bit too. So once you explain what you're we're showing here, and if people don't know Clayton, then they don't know Kubernetes. I think that's a bumper sticker somewhere. Um, he is one of the, the lead contributors and architects for OpenShift and, um, and on Kubernetes itself. So um, his watching someone like him evolve over time is really um, a, a good example of, you know, how how someone onboards and gets deeply, deeply involved into a project. Yeah, so so this, this task force contains a couple of widgets, as you can see, and then this is so far for the uh, 2012 year, so this is eight years ago. Uh, on the left, we have the number of commits for each of the projects, and then repositories for each of the projects we have for each of the bars, we'll see more bars and uh, they're in the next in the next years for Clayton. And then for each of them, this is split into the different uh, different repositories this developer has been participating at. Um, then at the same time we have on the right like uh, uh, a diagram where we can see Clayton uh, in the middle and then we will we will see all of the repositories Clayton has been participating at in each of the years. So then we, we will see like a uh, snapshot of Clayton for 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015. So this is at the very beginning of OpenShift, and then we have uh, Origin, not WordPress example, and then Django example. So those are the two or three main main uh, projects where Clayton was, uh, in this case, contributing to. Uh, we move on. Then uh, this is 2013. Then we can see how there are uh, some more projects, Python interface. Uh, the, the, the website for, for OpenShift in GitHub, uh, REST client for Java, and Java client, and some others. Then we see how uh, the network is kind of growing. Um, 2014, then we can see OpenShift. This is still most of the activity for Clayton, but then we go for uh, for certain projects. And so we, uh, instead of having uh, the projects in the CNCF ecosystem split by uh, Kubernetes or Jagger and so on. So, as I mentioned before, we have uh, graduated and, and, and incubated. Um, so then you will see how this keeps growing. But if we go to the specific uh, repositories, then we can see that this is Kubernetes, uh, this is the API, and then uh, these are examples to use Kubernetes. And then we see how the uh, this, this is the whole activity of Clayton in uh, 2014 in this case. We keep advancing. Then most of the work is in OpenShift origin, but then more and more commits are done in the uh, CNCF ecosystem. Uh, 2016, even more repositories. And then we have incubating projects. So uh, this is probably uh, uh, well, so some new projects in the CNCF ecosystem, plus all of the graduated ones. So most of them, as you can see, are Kubernetes examples, community, Gengo, uh, cluster, registry, API, and Kubernetes. Uh, then we can go to 2017, uh, Clayton keeps uh, growing. Uh, 2018, we have some activity in the operator framework. Clayton has started to participate there. Uh, and then 2000, 2019, so we have operator framework, some incubating projects, graduated and OpenShift. And then uh, kind of nowadays, so the last six months approximately, so this is most of the activity we have for Clayton. So, so this is this is interesting because had we known nothing about Clayton um, and or the oncoming of Kubernetes um, ha, and we'd been watching Clayton back in 2012 evolve, um, 
theoretically, we could have started to see the importance and the rise of Kubernetes to um, this. If uh, anybody outside of Red Hat probably could have seen it. I think we saw it inside because Clayton was vociferously endorsing um, the work that was going on in Kubernetes. But I think you can see from this example, um, there's also ways to start seeing, you know, as people um, move to other technologies, um, whether they're Edge or IoT, or they start using Open Data Hub or um, different networking solutions or, you know, load balancers or whatever it is, you can start seeing when they start contributing to other projects or um, posting questions about them, you can start to see where things break down or where things are picking up speed. Um, and where projects are maturing. Um, and so it's a really useful set of tooling um, for people who are ecosystem watchers like myself. Do you want to add any more to that, Daniel? Uh, want to pop back? I thought we can move to, uh, to the uh, organization persona specifically. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. And then we can hit the slides after that, Natalie. Yeah. So, yeah, so this is this example in the same way that we can uh, look for a specific people or, or uh, newcomers, so in this case, newcomers persona. Uh, we, we we were discussing that it's it's important for you, uh, Nayam, the uh, newcomers in, in the sense of new new organizations coming to the uh, to the community. And then the relations with with other uh, communities or organizations. So in this case, the example we see uh, right here in this chart is Uber activity in the whole CNCF plus OpenCF plus operators. So the dots again are developers, and then we can see that well certain certain specific repositories. So we have Open Tracing. Uh, then we can see uh, with, uh, some more Open Tracing, Open Tracing. Uh, Jagger in this case, and then we have the developers working there. ETC, more open tracing, uh, gRPC, Prometheus, okay, um, and then perhaps if, if we move to the to the next one, then we can see how this is related to Red Hat, right? So then uh, maybe you can elaborate a bit more about the importance of, uh, of connectors. Yeah. This. So I I think one, there's a couple of things that this is showcasing and um, is one, I look at OpenShift from an organizational based um, set of glasses. So I like to look at whether it's Uber, who is not an OpenShift customer, how they touch down um, in, our, in our ecosystem, how, um, and then people who are our end users touch um, our different spheres of influence and how we're connected to them. Um, but this is also, really, you know, shows me if I need to find someone to talk about um, not just open tracing, but maybe Prometheus or chaos engineering or, you know, whatever it is, this starts to show me the people who are the influences, influencers or the connectors between projects. So say I'm looking for someone who's done something with Grafana, open tracing and Kubernetes and OpenShift. These diagrams to, to speak to internally at Uber, right? Or, you know, at a, at, at a conference like CNCF. It allows me to figure out and trace, not to be using a pun, trace the relationship back to someone who might either be that person to speak or know the person or help a pers another person speak um, uh, with a little bit more uh, insight into the project. So it's really been a huge tool to help um, build peer-to-peer -peer relationships to help um, collab foster collaboration across projects and to see where organically you know, cross-pollination between projects is happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so in, in this case, what we can see um, in, in this example are uh, Uber and Red Hat uh, contributions to, to those projects that we mentioned. So CNCF with graduated and incubated uh, operators and OpenShift. And then uh, the legend of colors is this purple is Red Hat and then Uber is kind of this uh, brown orange color. Then we can see that there are some Uber developers and then there are relations because we can see that there are different developers. If you, yep. go, back, if you go back up a little bit, that really big dot there, um, mm -hmm. is Travis Nelson, who oh, is, oh, yeah. I, have, I have to know if you added Rook in here, 
he's the gentleman behind or one of the leads on um, Rook. So it's like, it's interesting to see where people pop up in other um, mm -hmm. diagrams as well. So, and there's a whole slew of work there. So which repository is, is that one connecting to that Travis is in, in the center of? Oh, so this is, these are all of the incubating projects. So these are all of the projects that we have oh, under this label. I, I would mm -hmm. bet that is, yeah, that's, he's there because of Rook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's again, why you kind of need some domain knowledge as well. Um, so it's, not a perfect, it's not going to make you AI intelligent about um, who's in your community, but it does give you a, a big jump start. Um, mm -hmm. on... Yeah, it's, it's, and, and that's, that's a really good point, the domain, the domain expertise, because uh, each time, so it, <laughs> it usually happens, right? Like uh, I point to certain data sets and then you say, oh, that makes absolutely sense because of this and this reason. And then I said, okay, so it's like I can, I can point to the, uh, to the specific, uh, oddities in the data set or specific like uh, highlight certain areas and then you say oh that makes sense because of this um, yeah. and then you can go there and dig into the data and so on so that's that's really really important to, to have this tandem between context knowledge and uh, domain knowledge and, and expertise with with the tool mm -hmm. so should i pop mm. back in, into the slides so and the, just one? just to mention so then we have, yeah yeah. You you share your screen? I will share my screen now. We'll pop back in the slides and talk a little bit about the personas. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Here. So we talked a little bit about this. And let's see if we can get this to go forward. There we go. So this is, you know, the Uber diagram. No, I keep using that word, but the over thing. And, and this is Again, I, this is a screenshot from 2019. It is much bigger now, um, and I need to take a new screenshot. But we dove in a little bit in to see how things worked with Jaeger, with Jaeger and OpenShift and Kubernetes, and, and it was really helpful for me. Again, especially when I was first learning a little bit about Jaeger and Open Tracing, to be able to be knowledgeable about who was in the community was key um, for me to be able to be helpful and helping them nurture the relationship with the CNCF to get to incubating and now graduated status. So, um, and I was not a participant in that community. So I had no foreknowledge other than that. The other thing that it lets you tease out is where other people in who you know in the community, like Greg Swift, I had no idea he had any connection to Jaeger. So it was really pretty cool to be able to do this. And so this kind of led us to that kind of first pass at really leveraging the data led us to start talking about um, OKD personas because OKD is really the project that I try and um, foster um, along with a few others um, like Quay and operators and others. But this is really meant for me by assigning personas to these folks um, have helped me sort of untangle the community relationships. And so we kind of, I, at the moment, I have about five um, personas that I, uh, look at um, and categorize people as. Um, the tangential personas, the people who um, are in, who are working in one community and working in, um, but not working in others. So they're kind of tangential to your project. They may not be working on OpenShift, um, but they're still important to OpenShift. So like Yuri from Uber or connector personas um, that are working in multiple ones. Those are really good. And then we mentioned earlier newcomer personas um, very important part of community development is flagging new entrants, uh, fostering them, making, you know, understanding how long they stay, how long it takes them to get deeply involved. Very important aspect of community development. Identifying project leads and personas. So Clayton, of course, was an, a known entity to anyone inside of Red Hat and pretty much anyone inside of Kubernetes, but starting to figure out how to identify other folks um, as we want to create more diverse and healthy ecosystems and someday Clayton might want to retire. So who are we going to level up um, and put in maintainer and contributor roles who was doing that and you know to make sure we have a diverse and healthy group of project leads. And then again for me um, organizational personas that's when you aggregate everybody from um, whether it's Uber or Amadeus or any one of the um, end users that are using your project to really understand how they're using it and what other projects they're using. So um, as we saw, we didn't actually have the data for OpenStack, but if we could have gone back further because Clayton had done some work on a little tiny aspect of um, OpenStack with me ages ago, 
Um, and so when we bring in the OpenStack one, you can even tease it out how people migrate from OpenStack to Kubernetes um, or in other aspects. So it's really a very interesting way to see how people show up in communities um, and where things are going. And the, the small part of OpenStack was a project called Solemn, um, which was supposed to be OpenStack's platform as a service back in the day, if anyone remembers that. Shout out to Adrian Otto. Um, and yeah, so we could really dive into that. The other one we talked about was organizational personas to be able to see um, where they're working in, what space, you know, where they overlap, when they contribute to your project, to other projects. Um, and really, uh, we use that for, I use that on a regular basis um, to understand what our end users are doing and to make sure that, you know, if there's a new feature or a new set of technologies out there like Edge or IoT or networking, storage, you, you name it, that they're looking at or starting to contribute to, and we want to make sure we know that from a product per, 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 uh, perspective and from a community perspective. So we hey, do I, sometimes, this is a good one here, I'll, I'll just walk through it um, quickly here. This was all of the projects that CERN was contributing to. Um, and then uh, the other person that we started to look at um, when we dive down into an, an individual person, because we knew Greg Swift, who is now at Log DNA, um, but at the time was at Rackspace, so he had some OpenStack connections had that tiny little, or not tiny, it was, I'm sure it was a real contribution to the Jaeger conversations, but we could start to play out and see um, where they were um, playing in that. So it's it's really kind of um, interesting, and plus I had all the data from Common, so um, you know, hence and therefore uh, in 2018, he was also my um, contributor to the conversations in the community um, award that we, we gave him. So. So there's really lots of great ways to use this. And then, as I mentioned earlier, um, Yuri, who was tangential, but very important to this, um, as well as um, other work that's being done at Uber on operators um, and the operator pattern, using it for M3DB, um, showcased that at a Commons event, a while, or on, they were showcasing that at a CNCF event um, a while back. So getting these advanced signals, even if they're weak signals, they're still really important signals to be aware of um, what people are doing and hence um, some influence around the conversations around operators and operator framework and the operator pattern um, kind of emerged and that was that was pretty important. Um, again, being able to really look deeply into one of your corporate customers' um, personas, where they show up, what they're working on, um, using OCP on Azure, OCP on OpenStack, um, we've there. Amadeus has been huge OpenShift Commons community members. They've been on stage at Red Hat Summit. They've been in CNCF talks. Um, we, but being able to really see where they're going and what new technologies they might be working on, we had them on um, talking about Kafka not too long ago on stage because they were some of the leading lights using in an enterprise situation Kafka and willing to talk about it. So it was a great opportunity to do that. Um, there's also, I mentioned going down wormholes. Uh, this might have been one of the wormholes, because, um, but it turned out to be not quite as bad of a wormhole as I thought it was. Uh, we kind of laugh a little bit about this one, is that um, the data is not always perfect. And every once in a while, it, when we do the sorting hat, and this is where we go back to you know, having some domain expertise, teasing out why um, Kim Min showed up as a contributor to uh, OpenShift. Uh, turned out to be a, um, a misinterpretation of the data in terms of one of the issues or something that was logged to something. However, um, it did give me a very weak signal that at Alibaba uh, and Alipay, they were looking at uh, OpenShift and OKD and Origin, which then merged into, um, uh, they eventually had a, a de deployment of OpenShift and OKD there. So it was, and I ran into them at, one of the CNCF events, or it was a Linux Foundation event, and they came up to me afterwards and said, hey, yeah, yeah, we are. This is this is who I am. But correctly identifying people is pretty important, too. And then, as everybody's well aware of, um, we have another problem space, too, is now that IBM and Red Hat are conjoined twins um, and uh, are all under one umbrella, 
learning uh, who is in the IBM world that are also contributing to the different projects so that we can, you know, make the best um, and make take advantage of where we have other representation and other network connections in, in projects. So that's another thing that we've been looking at um, closely with all of this data. So, um, yeah, those are pretty important relationships, obviously. Um, it really has helped us um, a lot from uh, the Commons model, um, which is ecosystem-based um, for open source community development that we're working with here at OpenShift and at Red Hat. Um, and really what our goal is, is not to, is we're not trying to stalk people or do that. We're really trying to promote peer-to-peer -peer interactions. So it allows us to understand where those interactions are happening across projects and nurture them to, um, as I always like to say, give away the podium um, and because it's it's often not about the code contribution at all. It's more about sharing the information, the knowledge, making the connections so that someone's working on one feature in one project that impacts another one, getting them to connect or be able to facilitate your feature getting into their roadmap. Making those connections are really the things that um, community development is now all about, um, rather than trying just to get everybody to contribute code to your, so my, your metrics on this stack analytics or whatever the dashboard is, looks great. We all know that's a wonderful thing um, to be the number one contributor to a project or whatever, and you know our, our powers that be love us to, to be there. However, the more important thing is that all of the communication and the network of peers is um, nurtured and healthy and again diverse um, and well engaged and know how to engage with each other. So that has really been um, the model that we've been going for with um, OpenShift Commons is giving away the podium, pulling in, in the people to speak at things like OpenShift Commons briefings on topics that you might not have thought were relevant. But once you look at the model, you can see, oh, there's this project out there that's um, that's about to hit you all like a ton of bricks, so you'd better know something about it. So we'll pull someone in there and give them the podium. So that's really kind of what we've um, been teasing out um, over the past couple of years. And um, whenever anyone hears me talk about jellyfish, they probably shut down their ears now. Um, but these are the kinds of tools that we really think um, help build healthy communities um, because it's not possible any longer with the complexity in these communities and these relationships to do it on gut or personal relationships. There are just way too many repos to watch. There are way too many people in those repos. There are way too many relationships. Um, and so much of our companies and our customers and our end users depend on these things being well-oiled machines that we can't really risk it on a gut instinct or Diane putting a mailing list into a spreadsheet and doing analytics on it anymore. We haven't done that for a long time. Um, this has really been the thing that's helped us um, to do this. And so uh, these are some of the conclusions that we, we have sort of reached. There's many more that we can tease out here. But I think it's pretty obvious that no company, whether it's an end user company, a technology company, uh, a hosting provider is really working on just one thing. Um, that's been pretty key. And um, this is data-driven approach has been really helpful for upstream coordination. Um, and that is essential. And these relationships really, really matter to everybody. Um, having domain knowledge um, is really been key. And um, this is not really an attack on old school um, community individual management, that's kind of nurturing still needs to happen um, for your project. You can't abandon that, that um, but it does behoove you to um, take a more um, ecosystem approach, approach and to help you do that um, with some data-driven tools. And then, um, as Daniel always tells me, data matters. Um, <laughs> You've got to clean your data and curate your data, and you need good tools like we've gotten from Betergia. And I, I know um, I had in the beginning a routine every Saturday morning. I'd sit down with a cup of coffee and run the report and see who the outliers were and where the, um, 
where there was duplication, where the sorting hat didn't work and have to go back in and do that um, cleanup work. So I, I think that's been, for me, um, one of the habits uh, for that I would like to see more community people develop um, and incorporate is really to start um, understanding who's in your community. I can't say that more vociferously. That is the key to all of this. Um, if you don't understand the domain and you don't know who's in your community, um, it's really difficult to do any aspect of community development, be it marketing, content delivery, coach contribution, onboarding, any, any, any aspect of community. Um, and then I always put that anonymity is dead because it is. And then maybe what's next? Um, now that we're part of IBM, maybe someday they'll give me access to IBM Watson and we can tie that in and do some real predictive analysis or take even better um, open data hub and apply it to this, um, just like we do for telemetry and other things. So um, that's kind of where we're at um, right now uh, in terms of the deep dive here. And Daniel, is there, um, now that I've talked forever, other things <laughs> that you, you want to you add in there? And I'll look and see if we have any uh, questions or if anyone's asked anything. Uh, no many, no many, no many more things to, to add here. Um, so just to say that this is a really interesting and funny thing to, to deal with. So I'm really happy to have participated and keep evolving this, yeah. uh, this idea and concept. So, so thanks for your time. Yeah, the, the one question that's come in, which I think is a good one too, is um, what the correlation between code collaboration between personas and the company team membership. Um, that, that's an interesting one. Um, I've used the tooling so far to identify the team from, say, Amadeus or Uber, who, you know, who is working on the open source side. It doesn't give me insights into who's behind the firewall. Um, I don't always know everybody at Amadeus or that, but it does give me a way to, to do that. Um, we could easily, with this tool, watch the development like we did with Clayton's um, analysis. Um, instead of just doing an individual, watch the growth of open source um, participation in different repos for an entire organization. That's um, And that would show us the collab, I, I think a, a bit of the, correlation between code uh, collaboration between the personas and that what we haven't done is tagged um, the the tagging or the grouping of people into those personas is still um, a hand wavy Diane thing like when I see someone that's I recognize them now as a tangential or I recognize them as con there we don't the tooling does not recognize people um, automatically yet. Um, as that or and that's where I think maybe the predictive stuff might help us too is to recognize as some what the path is to being from going from tangential to being connected to multiple things and historically and and you know there's only so much time in the day but these are things that are very much of interest to me to continue to do with this work is um, you know as we try and nurture healthy engage and diverse um, uh, communities, these kinds of toolings and the metadata that we add to, say, the sorting hat and the identity management will hopefully help us tease out um, different issues around marginalized communities um, and um, make sure that we give the podium and the support people across um, lots of communities, whether they're technology communities or communities of interest um, in other aspects of their lives. I think that's um, what we had for time for today. Um, and I know, Daniel, it's late where you are. You're off in Spain and I'm up in Canada. And um, <laughs> we're probably the only people that don't care about the holiday coming up this weekend. Um, but um, if you have questions, please do reach out to us. Um, we're very happy to, uh, to make that happen for you. Um, and let me just throw up the last page here or my favorite page here the Canadian one because yesterday was July 1st Canada Day um, and this is a wonderful Wayne Gretzky um, quote here is the goal here is to skate to where the puck is going not to where it's been but where it's been always um, informs us um, hopefully 
of how to, to, to grow new people in your community and keep them engaged. So with that, and we'll see if we can get to the next slide some days. Um, we'll just say thank you. And um, if you're interested in this topic, please reach out to us um, and we'll be happy to continue the conversation.